In this episode, Mr. Scott Henderson and I will explore what we're told by NASA about the lack of air pressure in so-called space and analyze whether its own equipment, such as the Apollo Lunar Module and the astronauts' spacesuits, would actually survive. Let's start by covering a real-life example of the power of a vacuum due to one air pressure system being reduced adjacent to another air pressure system. Hey, hey everyone, welcome back to Brainy Beaver's channel. Tonight we're going to take a look at the Flat Earth's mortal enemy, the almighty vacuum. The only thing getting crushed tonight is their juvenile understanding of said vacuum. And as a refrigeration technician, I'd like to say that while I wouldn't argue that I know nearly as much as any scientist on the matter, I want to say that I'm definitely, well, let's say I'm authority adjacent. So let's wade into the cesspool of stupid and see where we come up for air. Whoa! What's all this? Nice intro, buddy. I mean, I don't want to lie. That intro makes me want to be a flat earther, you know? It's so catchy. Anyways, uh, I don't know, but he's on to something. That's all I'm saying. Now with more platypus than ever. The classic example, at least in my mind, is a railroad tanker car. You can search for and find many examples online of the structural integrity of a tanker car failing when the air pressure inside is reduced, which eventually subjects the walls of the tanker car to levels of pressure it cannot withstand on the outside of the tank, and it implodes in a thrilling fashion. <laughs> Some tanker cars are made of aluminum, some are made of steel, and they fail rather dramatically when the air pressure inside is reduced to a point where the air pressure inside the tank is not strong enough to withhold the force of the air pressure pushing against the outside of the tank. The key to grasping this is understanding what I refer to as back pressure, or the lack thereof. Boo! First of all, I want to inform you, my good sir, that you didn't make the term back pressure. I used back pressure the other day to describe, you know, back pressure. This is going to be fun, I can tell already. In an episode of the popular science show, Mythbusters, Adam and Jamie collapsed a steel train tanker car by lowering the air pressure inside the tank down to 3.4 pounds per square inch, or PSI, meaning they had increased the outside pressure pushing against the walls of the tanker to 11.3 PSI which equates to about 1,600 pounds per square foot of external pressure over the entire outside of the tank. I love what he did there. He wanted to make sure it hammers out into the biggest number it can, when in reality he just turned PSI into PSF, essentially. He did a one-to-one -one conversion. There's no equating to. I mean, sure, okay, he had to times 11.3 by 144 to make the change from square inches to square feet, but nothing magic happened there. It's still the same pressure it was before, no matter the big tag he adds to it. For example, when you jump up and down, you would think that you would apply the force landing that is similar to your own body weight. However, there's no limit to the force involved in a two-foot landing other than the maximum deceleration will be limited by how much compression there is at the contact point. What this means is that a 200-pound human can exert a 1,000 pounds of force upon landing. All these seem like big numbers until you realize that they've always been there and really mean nothing at this level as long as what you're dealing with has been designed for those forces. 1,500! 5,000 feet! Dear Lord, that's over 150 atmospheres of pressure. How many atmospheres can the ship withstand? Well, it's a spaceship, so I'd say anywhere between zero and one. Those numbers are derived from the fact that at sea level, we experience approximately 14.7 PSI. So before some of the air was vacuumed out of the tanker car, there was approximately 14.7 PSI pushing on both the inside and the outside of the tank. But as the air pressure was reduced inside to 3.4 PSI, about a 75% vacuum, 
That meant there was a difference, or negative pressure as some call it, of 11.3 pounds per square inch, which equates to more than eight tons per square meter crushing into the tank externally on all sides. And here we are. So we started at 11.3 pounds per square inch. We moved up to square feet to hammer home the 1,600 pounds. And now we're going to multiply again and get ourselves to almost eight tons per meter squared. Not quite, but we can just call it eight tons of pressure pushing inwards on it. That's incredible, isn't it? Until I tell you that when you dive 25 feet in the water, you have the same amount of pressure pushing inwards on your body above and beyond your back pressure you so cleverly coined, right? Well, I have dove to 115 feet and that's 65.7 PSI of pressure acting on my body. Well, that's over 9,460 pounds per foot squared or a whopping 46.2 tons per meter. You see how these numbers get big fast but mean nothing because we know objects can already go this deep, including weak, fleshy meat bags like us. It means nothing. Did you know that 14.7 PSI equates to approximately 10 tons of force for every square meter? But, you may ask, how do we survive as humans with such a force applied externally to our bodies in all directions? Well, it's simple. There's 14.7 PSI of back pressure too. A perfect state of equilibrium. And this is the important point. Now, let's go to so-called space. No, let's go back to the so-called water since I already covered that we can absolutely handle higher pressures. We have a way of testing your examples, for instance. My little girl was testing out one of your examples when she put one of her toys into the water this just today. And to be blunt, the external pressure on an item stacks on and adds to or makes the internal pressure for something simply because you have the 14.696 PSI of pressure pushing in. As a result, it also has to push back once you start to become compressed. If it didn't, you would crush. So it's not that we don't crush as a result of the pressure, it's that the internal pressure is a result of the world trying to crush you. And you already pushing back. And apply these concepts that are observable, testable, repeatable here on Earth. When we talk in terms of space, the most common scale used is Tor. And it's expressed as 10 to a negative number meaning there are a bunch of zeros after the decimal point before you get to the numbers. At sea level, 14.7 PSI equates to 760 Tor. And if you could achieve a perfect vacuum, which is not attainable, a 100% vacuum, it would be considered zero PSI. Now bear with me here as it's important to understand the conversion from PSI to Tor and then back again to put it in terms that we are accustomed to in order to fully understand how strong the negative pressure would be in space. That again is if space exists as we are told it is. It's not a negative pressure, it's literally no pressure. You said this yourself, for crying out loud. And if you could achieve a perfect vacuum, which is not attainable, a 100% vacuum, it would be considered zero PSI. You better explain to the people the difference between 0 PSI G and 0 PSI A, or they might be awfully confused why they have a vacuum around them when they try to do flat earth sciences. Our gauges in PSI G have accounted for sea level pressure and have been adjusted to negate it, so that we don't have to take away 14.696 every time we look at a pressure gauge and go, what's the pressure? To crush the tanker car, the air pressure was reduced from 760 Tor to 176 Tor, that is 14.7 PSI down to 3.4 PSI inside the tank. The Kármán line, as it is called, is considered to be the boundary into outer space from Earth, and it exists at approximately 62 miles, or 100 kilometers, above the surface of the Earth. At this altitude, we are told the air pressure is 10 to the negative 3 Tor. That equals just 0.000002 PSI. Up to the Kármán line, the environment there is classified as a quote-unquote low vacuum. So, if we were in a capsule of sorts at 62 miles above the surface of the Earth, we are told that the air pressure being applied to the outside of the capsule is down to just 0.000002 PSI. But the pressure inside the capsule, if we took off from sea level, like most rockets do, would again be 10 tons per square meter. How do you think the capsule we are in would be able to withstand 10 tons of pressure per square meter on the inside of the capsule walls trying to get out 
with just 0 0.000002 PSI of back pressure. Do you see where I'm going with this? <laughs> I mean, I see where you're going with this, but you're being an idiot, so I'm having a hard time taking you seriously. You talk about the lack of back pressure as if it's additive to your over-glorified 10 tons per meter square, but it isn't. You're still just talking about that 10 tons and you already calculated it. You can have 0 decimal 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1 PSI in there for a vacuum, and it won't matter. It's still just 14.696 PSI, or one-third the total pressure of a Coca-Cola can at room temperature before you crack it. You see where I'm going with this? Yeah, you called it. I'm calling you an idiot. Hey, it, uh, looks like somebody's been doing some shopping. And that means somebody's been doing a lot of walking and getting more and more worn out. Because by the time a woman assembles a complete spring wardrobe, she's generally covered a lot of floor space in a lot of stores. So it's little wonder that smart shoppers everywhere take time out to pause and refresh. And where else but in the fountain where they serve ice-cold Coca-Cola? Good golly, that was sexist. From 10 to the negative 3 tour to 10 to the negative 9 tour, is classified as a quote-unquote high vacuum. And the scale is not linear, it's exponential or even logarithmic. The largest and most powerful vacuum chamber in the world is located at NASA's Glenn Research Center in Sandusky, Ohio. According to NASA, their massive vacuum chamber has the capability to reduce the air pressure down to 10 to the negative 6 torr, which is 1,000 times stronger of a vacuum then 10 to the minus 3 tour at the Carmen line. And it takes many hours to pump the, uh, the air out to get down to 10 to the negative 6 tour. And the facility has 6 to 8 foot concrete walls reinforced with a leak-proof steel containment barrier built in so that the concrete dust and no air can be sucked through the walls and into the chamber itself and ruin the vacuum they are trying to create. If you were able to reduce the air pressure further inside a chamber, then you are getting into the quote-unquote ultra-high vacuum classification. This is 10 to the negative 9 tor and above, which is approaching the level of vacuum we are told exists on the surface of the moon, which is an astonishing 10 to the negative 11 tor, which is the numbers 100 million times stronger of a vacuum than the Kármán line. Yeah, but none of this changes that we're still just, in your own words, talking about zero PSIA. A difference of 14.696. I mean, I can times jack shit by a hundred million, a billion, or even a mega duper superlicia gaza billion like a kid would. But you're just you're still just going to get nothing because you're talking about such minute amounts of pressure that it hurts my soul you try to make the argument that it's a powerful force. Now this Paul on the pill or whatever his name is says a lot more stupid things and I'm only about halfway through so I think that this became a two-parter to be honest. One of the things I'm planning to do if I can, and I have what I need so if I can is if I can get it done, is I want to pull a vacuum around a can of soda at room temperature. I can probably get it down to 0. .0002 PSI. After that, we're not even talking about pigeon farts. Not to mention that the soda can has approximately 60 PSI in it at sea level and room temperature. I bet it doesn't explode as the design burst pressure is 100 PSI. And even if we reduce surrounding pressure on the can to 0 PSI, it would only bring our total can pressure to 75 PSI. So maybe come back for that. It should be fun. Please like and subscribe if you haven't so we can kick the piss out of more Flat Earthers next week.